Okay. Welcome. My name is Tyler Young. I'll be your substitute teacher for for this evening. Thankful to be able to to uh, be back and appreciate those who covered class and filled in at the last minute and such and uh, uh, I know it seems like half the congregation or more has had COVID or, or has it right now so um, a lot of people have had it a lot worse it's um, I just have a, another health issue that it aggravated and that's my main problem right now so so we're working on that, but um, so I'm kind of day to day, and I'm glad I felt uh, a little better today, so that I could come up and teach. And I've been really looking forward to getting back into this. I hope hope everyone. It's been weeks since we met in here for this class. Uh, let's see. Uh, for, yeah, for for those, I think I had a Bob Ross sweater on. The, for those, a Christmas sweater. Um, those who are watching the videos in succession may not realize we haven't had class for several weeks so over the holidays and then I missed so um, so we don't have that continuity here I'm just gonna mention what we finished class with here a minute ago but since we met we had the holidays and everything I hope you had a, uh, a blessed Christmas season and uh, Got to see family and, and enjoy yourselves. And uh, as we embrace this new year, we'll say a little bit from the pulpit Sunday that I, that I had planned to on the first Sunday of the new year about uh, inviting God's blessings for us for the, for the coming year and some challenges and, and things along that line. So we were blessed to, to have that Sunday after that weekend of Christmas off and we got to go be with Jessica and Jacob and the kids so I thought I'd share that with you and I just wanted you to look at my grandsons in the corner there I don't know where they get this kind of thing from <coughs> clowning around and uh, somebody got a Bucky's hat for uh, did anyone else get a Bucky's hat for Christmas I feel sorry for every last one of you. Okay. But maybe next year. All right. There's, if you're good, you must have been on the naughty list, uh, Sean. You know, I kept thinking about Barry and you, and I know there's others who had COVID pretty bad, but weren't you basically in bed for four days sleeping when you had it? Because that appears to be what's happening to my sister. So, uh, you know, it, it's strange how it affects everybody a little bit differently you know it's not a really consistent pattern across the board so um, everybody's got a it can, kind of has their own situation uh, in in dealing with it so well uh, so if you can think back now several weeks ago this well four weeks ago now I, I guess it was the this chapter here we're seeing now conflict after Luke paints a bright picture of God's work and the explosion of growth of the early church here in Jerusalem and exciting things are happening and and uh, doors are being opened and souls are being saved and the kingdom of God is increasing and you're, we're, we're seeing this new community of believers and their fellowship and the love they're expressing and they have favor with all the people but we know that didn't last and persecution then begins and that's where we see Peter and John here essentially arrested and brought before the council and so after that whole episode and they went back to the church and see this is where we see when we face trying times whether together whether individually or as the body of Christ we need to come together we need each other this is a great example of how adversity drives the church together and they come together and pray and we see we saw at the end of chapter 4 or getting to that final paragraph how they use this psalm to remind themselves that uh, despite the machinations of the world despite the opposition 
of, by the enemies of God, that God still has set his anointed one on his throne. They were putting all of this in theological and historical perspective. So they used the word of God in their prayer. And then uh, this is that that text that I kind of hurried through after they prayed through that psalm, that great text, we went back and looked at the whole psalm, Psalm 2. And so then they recount for verse 27, chapter 4, verse 27, For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, drawing on the term anointed there from the, from the passage in psalm, Psalms, the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now look upon their threats. I like that they, they leave it to God to deal with the hostility. They want God to take note of it. And whatever God's going to do about it, they're trusting the Lord. Look on their threats. Take note of their threats. But whatever they do... This reminds me of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, we, uh, our God's able to deliver us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow to your image, O king. So, in other words, their resolve was set no matter what God was going to do or not do to protect them in that given situation. So they said, you know, look on their threats, but what mattered to them was that, that you would grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. So we talked about the need in the face of growing opposition in our own culture to, to encourage each other and to pray to be bold, not to be intimidated, not to favor, to, to capitulate for the favor of, of the world and, and all those things that we talked about. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place which they were gathered together, in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God. And Luke keeps emphasizing uh, that the, the agency by which this is brought about is his primary emphasis is this is what Jesus is doing through the church by the Holy Spirit. But you see the agency of the word that it's in the it's in the word of God that the. Uh, impact. This is how the gospel is impacting the, the community and the, the culture is through the church's faithful witness of the word of God. So they continue to speak the word of God. That's what people need here in our community to hear from the League City Church of Christ, that we're going to speak the word of God. No matter what the world thinks, we're going to speak the word of God. We're going to, we're going to speak it in love, Ephesians 4.15, but we're going to do it with boldness. So, so I kind of rushed through that at the end of the class. But now look, look at this. Uh, Tyler, what was, the, yeah. what was the phrase, whom you anointed? What is the anointing referring to? The crucifixion? Well, no, I think the, remember this is Luke, right? Luke part two. And the programmatic passage in Luke, in Luke 4, is when Jesus gets up and he cites Isaiah and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. You anointed me to bring good tidings to the poor and recovering a sight to the blind, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He, he quotes from Isaiah there. So in other words, he's saying, you sent me as your anointed one. So I, I think it, it could refer to the coming of the Holy Spirit on him. Remember, prophets, priests, and kings were all anointed to show. What would an anointing show? When, when a king would kneel down and a prophet would pour oil and anoint him, or if a prophet was anointed, what did that mean? Not, not just the physical act of pouring, not the, the ritual itself, but what did the ritual signify? The selection process. Yeah, this is God's approval on him. So, so when he quotes this, they, they were, he's talking about the Davidic king and how they were plotting against David, and now they apply this to Jesus. And despite their opposition, God anointed him. In other words, God made him king. God showed he was his Messiah, his, his holy one, his chosen one. And so I think it signifies um, that God put the Holy Spirit on Jesus 
signifying he was his chosen one, the one, you know, you had prophets, priests, and kings who were anointed, but Jesus is the anointed one, the one whom God has chosen, whom God has sent. So, yeah, it's a good question. So is you God? <coughs> Yeah, they're, I think they're praying to God because they say, your servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. And in this, in the prophecy from, in the Messianic Psalm there, in Psalm 2, um, the, the rulers of the world gather together against the Lord and against his anointed. But then the text goes on to say, they don't cite it here, and Luke doesn't cite it here if they did. But the text goes on to say where the Lord says, I have set... He who sits in the heaven laughs, and he holds them in derision and says, As for me, I have set my king on my hill, on Zion, on my holy hill. So, um, so yes, I think it's talking about God the Father, and that uh, when the king was anointed, he becomes a son. This same prophecy is quoted later in Acts 13 by Paul uh, of the resurrection. And it's quoted twice in Hebrews. In, in Hebrews 1, 5, and then again in Hebrews chapter 2, I believe it is, again, not long after, it's cited the part of the psalm that says, You are my son. This day I have begotten you. Because when the king would, anoint, when the king would be anointed, he was considered God's representative, God's son. And so he was born, he was begotten, he becomes God's son when he ascends to the throne and sits on the throne. All that language is in that psalm they're citing there. That's what was involved. So, so you're raising an interesting question because later that text is applied to the resurrection of Jesus. When Jesus was raised, he was anointed by the Spirit, he was the anointed one sent into the world, but that passage is cited to show when he was raised from the dead, he was anointed to, be on, to, to reign on the throne. So you, we'll see that in Acts 13 when Paul quotes it later. So I think it's talking about God selecting him, sending him into the world, giving him the spirit, and, uh, and then raising him from the dead and setting him on the throne, his resurrection and exaltation and reign. So there's a lot, to, there's a lot of theology in that actually, Barry. God's, uh, the way the anoint, Jesus being declared the one whom God anointed has very broad, far-reaching implications about who Jesus is and what God has done with him. Whom you anointed. Whom you anointed. So, w we have this beautiful, beautiful summary statement then here. At the end of chapter 4, like there was at the end of chapter 2, right? Luke is covering a lot of history. We're seeing in this transitional moment in history, great things are happening. And there's very far-reaching effects of the gospel. And so occasionally, occasionally he will, frequently actually, he'll give us summary statements. Uh, but but the, I think the most elaborate ones are here early in Acts in chapter 2 and here in chapter 4. What does he tell us? That now the full number... The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. So he keeps stressing their, their unity. And no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And we talked about that at length back in chapter 2 uh, in a passage where Luke says something similar in Acts 2.36-42 uh, at the end of Acts 2. Through Acts 2 about verse 32 through 36 through the end of the chapter there, 42 through 46. Finally got it. Um, where he emphasizes they, that they were selling property and bringing it and sharing and, and how that's often abused to suggest that the government should redistribute wealth and we can create a sort of utopian environment through government control of, uh, you know, and the whole communist idea or socialism idea. So we talked about that at length. Of course, of course, it's not suggesting that. And at that time, we looked at this verse to show, here you still see this was a matter of individuals who are, still have their own private personal property and are acting out of simply the generosity of their hearts. But they're taking care of each other. This is the point, that, that, that uh, they had everything in common. They were sharing what they had. And this made a powerful impact. The love of God's people for each other. The love of the disciples for e each other. 
Wilson's here. I didn't even see a little. I, I, I think that was Wilson, but yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so the the character Jesus said, "By this all men shall know you're my disciples when you have love for one another." John thirteen thirty five. So this is identifying them as that they are committed to following Christ, and and it's having a huge impact. Uh, and notice he says, with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony. So the emphasis here is still on the apostles. Remember, they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, Acts 2.42. We'll see that again and again. They're giving their testimony. That's the same word for, for, from which the word witness comes. They're, they're testifying. They're giving eyewitness testimony of the resurrection. So this is being done. Uh, this is being demonstrated as true by the miracles they were performing. So miraculous power was uh, verifying their testimony. So you have this power and this testimony, and it's a testimony of the resurrection of Christ. That's the emphasis in the apostolic preaching, that God, that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. Well, wait, he was crucified. No, that was part of God's plan, and God has shown him to be his son by raising him from the dead. So the resurrection is a key emphasis. We talked about that as well when we were um, back in chapter 2. And then I like this. He says, and great grace was upon them all. So I love the use of the word grace to summarize these wonderful things that were happening. This is all because of the grace of God at work in their lives. Any, any good we, we do as the body of Christ is the grace of God at work, right? It's, the, it's because the favor of God is, is upon us, and we need to give God the glory for, for that. So, there was not a needy person among them. For as, many, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of what was sold, laid it at the apostles' feet. Notice the apostles' feet again. So, clearly we're, Luke wants to emphasize apostolic authority and that the church is being guided by the, by the apostles, and they're the main ones. Until, until persecution scatters them out of Jerusalem, the teaching is being done by the twelve. So, and it's being verified by the miracles performed by the twelve. It's not until they lay hands on others in Acts 6 that we learn of others doing signs and proclaiming the word. So, and they laid, uh, so they laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed uh, to each as any had need, and thus Joseph, who is called by the apostles Barnabas, and I love this, which means they, they renamed him son of encouragement or son of exhor exhortation. Um, a field that belonged to him, and he brought the money. Uh, there's some, I think I cut the text wrong. That doesn't, that's not a complete sentence, is it? Thus Joseph, who is called uh, by the apostles Barabbas. He sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, why, why is he singled out? Well, he's going to be a major figure, a companion of Paul on Paul's missionary journeys. And so here we're introduced to Barnabas. And um, he's going to stand in contrast now. See, this sets up a contrast. The, the genuineness of his faith and his generosity is going to be put in contrast with what's coming up. Ananias and Sapphira, right? But see, not everybody was like Barnabas, we're going to find out. But I love this, that he's called the son of encouragement because that's a, that's a Hebrew idiom especially, to call somebody the son of something. Like Peter says, you're sons of obedience, 1 Peter 1.13, as sons of obedience. So when Peter says we're children of obedience, he means when you're a child of something, your, your children bear your characteristics, right? Unfortunately, look at my poor son. You know, he's, uh, he's already balding in his late 20s, and, he, um, and sometimes people say, oh, you look like your, your dad, and he used to cry when people would say that to him when he was little. But, you know, he, he has my characteristics. He's my son, and so that's his nature. And it, it's, a, it's a way of saying obedience. You're a son of obedience. Obedience is your nature, to be obedient to God. That's what you are as a child of God. You're sons of obedience. Well, so to be a son of something means you're characterized by that trait. And he was, he was a man, obviously. See, not everybody has this gift. Uh, and I think we can all encourage each other, and we're all told to encourage each other. But man, some people, some people know how to say the right thing at the right time. And some, have you ever heard some preachers that, I mean, 
you know, the, the, if, if you had a spectrum of characteristics, um, I think preachers have different strong points. I, I tend to instruct and teach more and explain and give exposition more. You have other preachers, I've heard some who don't, don't ex I, I don't always feel they explain the text as well, but wow, can they put the fire in, can they get up and encourage you and move you because they're eloquent and well, like later we find out Paulus was an eloquent man. He was mighty in word and speech. So some people have that, that gift where uh, not just to tell you what God wants you to do, but who can really motivate you and encourage you to do it. And Barnabas is one of those special people that he stood out so much so that, that they, they named him Barnabas for that reason. And, um, and we need to try to be a Barnabas to others, those whom we can't. You might be able to be somebody's Barnabas. We may not all have his particular gift, but uh, we, we need to follow his model to the extent that we can. And I'm thankful for the Barnabases that I've had in my life. You know, we should do a sermon, shouldn't we, uh, on, uh, on that? be a Barnabas because uh, that, that is tremendously important and it's a beautiful thing to see how God has gifted us in different ways in the body. Not, not everybody can teach but some people, we're, we're getting to Romans 12 and I might need somebody to come up here and cut my head off in a minute Russ and then, I won't, then it won't hurt so, so much. Um, we're, we're, getting to, we're getting to Romans 12 where Paul talks about now uh, Let's all you he, he exhorts the, the saints in Rome to use whatever gifts they've given by the grace of God for the benefit of the whole body. To the one who has mercy, let him show mercy. To the teaching, let him teach. You know, so of course we're all supposed to be merciful, but some people have a, a special gift of compassion. Some people can teach. Some people so we need to think about well, what am I a son of? What 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 gift do I have that I can be developing for the benefit of the body of Christ, for God to use me and to use in me for, for the body of Christ? Um, think, think about th those things. And when we get to Romans 12 now and going through how we live out the gospel, that's one of the first things Paul says is, you know, uh, now, now that he's told us what the gospel is in Romans, then when he shifts to application of it and he says, use your gifts, in whatever way God has blessed you to build up the body. And that's what Barnabas was doing. And I like that he singles them out. But I think, I think too, one of the reasons he singled out is because of the contrast we're, we're going to see now with Ananias and Sapphira. Because what he's just given us, there is a picture of the, the love and the unity and the holiness that is being experienced in the fellowship of believers there in Jerusalem. And, and he does that to show now, see, he's going to introduce a threat to that unity. There, someone's actually going to challenge, in a way, apostolic authority and even undermine apostolic authority and sort of manipulate this body of believers for their own glory, for their own advantage. So let's think about what, when we look at Ananias and Sapphira, keep that in mind here. Luke is giving us the summary to say, ah, but now we've seen threats come from without, outside the body of Christ. But now he's showing us we see problems inside the body of believers and they have to be dealt with in the way that God uh, insists we deal with them. So, um, let, me, let me set this up here. and Let's read it. But what, what, is, what is happening here, really? Whenever you have a, a, a movement, right? Something big happening. Uh, people want to get on board with it, right? You see that in cults. People can get drawn in. You, see, you can see there are fads, there are trends. And we see this even in the church sometimes that w w w sometimes when the church experiences growth and the church is in a period of decline in the West now and in America and it's a real challenge to, 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 sa to save souls and to reach more people and grow the body of Christ. But uh, there, there are times when it, you know, people come into the body and 
we find out some don't have the right motives, right? Have you ever taught someone the gospel? John, Barry, you guys have been gospel preachers. Have you ever taught someone the gospel been really excited about their commitment and they're jumping in and taking part in everything? And then you find out, wait, you see. <laughs> then uh, circumstances can reveal who is sort of wanting to just be part of it for their own selfish reasons uh, and, and versus those who have genuine conviction, right? And so you're going to have people like Ananias and Sapphira, we're going to find this is going to be a, a, a perpetual problem in the body of Christ. And uh, so let's look at it. So, but, but, see the contrast here. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now the problem isn't that they didn't give it all, but that they lied about it. That's very, very important because Peter tells them they, they were under obligation to, take, to, to do what Barnabas did. It, it was their misrepresenting it. Now, why, why would they lie about it? Why, would that, why not just say, well, here's part of the money from the property we sold? It wouldn't look good. <laughs> All right, well, see, we want, we want the praise of men. We want to be thought of, we want to be highly regarded. So they, they see probably Barnabas as a man really respected in this community. Look at what a generous thing he did. People who were needing food, needing shelter, needing to be cared for, and, and people are giving what they have, and Barnabas steps up, and you have some other people. They want the praise of men, the glory of men. And that we have to be careful of our motives. Even in good things we do, we have to ask the Lord to help us examine our own motives. So, so Peter said to Ananias, and we're going to look at some of the theology and, and all these statements coming up. So why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While, now this is what we use this verse right here to refute this whole socialism idea where the government, by coercion, takes from people and redistributes uh, this here we see this is not, that is not what is happening here. The, this is free will offering of individuals. So verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? You weren't under obligation to do that, right? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but to God. So when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. We're going to get to, this is tremendous. Now, by the way, I apologize, but I'm going to preach on this. So you're going to hear a lot of this again, but I really want the whole congregation. I mentioned this to the elders among the sermons that I have planned coming up. I think it's a good time to introduce it, to talk about how we need to be looking out for one another in the body of Christ. And sometimes that means disciplining uh, those who need to be disciplined for the, their good and for the good of the, of the church. But, but, uh, as we've been pointing out with the pouring out of the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit, the tongues, the miracles, this is a unique period in church history, and this is a period of transition, and God is doing great wonders and signs. Remember what we said just like when a new dispensation began in the Old Testament when God made Israel his people, he appeared at Mount Sinai, and the mountain quaked, and there was lightning and thundering, and and you had miraculous manifestation, miraculous confirmation in ushering in a new era. So that's what you have here. So obviously, when we want to show people who want to go to the book of Acts and say, look, the church, if, you're, if we're the true church in the Bible, you should be having this whole Pentecostal experience and tongues and, and working miracles and signs. This is not normative. Just like that, God is not striking people dead. This is an, another example that this is not normative. This, these were uh, times where God is intervening in a unique way, in a, in a unique moment, for a specific purpose in history. So he's not, this isn't to be understood then as, well, whenever someone tries to lie to God and deceive the church, God's going to strike them dead. 
what he does here, so many times he'll do that to give an example, to give a warning. So it's not normative, but obviously this is, uh, has a huge impact. Verse 6 says, The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. So when his wife comes, she doesn't even know he's dead and buried. Now, why do you think they did that, by the way? You, you couldn't wait around to bury people before modern techniques of preservation and embalming and thing. Now, of course, I know the ancient Egyptians could embalm and we, we have corpses that have lasted 5,000 years going back into ancient Egypt, Egyptian period. But, but you, had to, you had to wrap people up and bury them in a timely way. Uh, and, and so people were generally buried right away when they died. So he doesn't really get into the time frame. He just, well, he actually... Uh, he does as far as um, how long till his wife came along. Mm -hmm. But the young men, they rose and they wrapped him and carried him out and buried him. So young, it's interesting, he says, there were young men. See, they, they're, look at the people that are involved. And this is part of the ministry of the church. What's your ministry? I bury the dead people who lie to the church leaders. Um, that's what we do. We wrap them up and take them out and bury them. Uh, okay, I have scripture reading this, this Wednesday. What do you have? I'm burying the dead, the dead people. So, but they have young men involved in this process, right? So uh, they carried, but after an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, him, I love this, I love the colloquialism here. So he says, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she says, yes, for so much. Well, in other words, Luke isn't concerned about the exact figures, so he just says, did you sell it for so much? You know, he, didn't, he wouldn't have said that explicitly, so much. He would have said, did you sell the land for, and then given the amount, and then she would have said. But to me, it's like when you're telling someone a story. Now, now Russ, some of you guys might know, what, so, like, like the Sandifers and some others that are from the north. Up there, like my mom and sister, my family, when they're telling you a story about what someone said and they don't have to tell you word for word, they'll say yada, yada, yada. Is that a, what do they say down here? Blah, blah, blah. I've heard people say, so I go and I'm telling the guy, you know, I'm waiting in line at the post office all this time, and then the guy in front of me says blah, blah, blah. You know, and you don't tell exactly what he said, but you find some other, well, back there they'll say, you know, and so the guy's like yada, 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 and I'm like, come on, mister. But so you just, you don't tell exactly the, the, the terms, but every time I hear that now, having lived in the South for so long, I think it sounds so funny to me, uh, and yada, yada, yada. So, uh, oh, my mom says, da, da, da. Have you ever heard that one? And so, yeah, the guy says to me, da, 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 and I'm like, okay, well, da, da, da. So, uh, yes, for so much, but Peter said to her, well, how is it you've agreed? So now he knows she was conspiring with him for this glory. You've agreed to test the Spirit of the Lord. We'll come back to that. Behold, the feet of those, and, and this is a great example of the use of synecdoche, where you use a part of something to represent the whole thing. The feet of those who buried your husband. Well, their whole bodies were at the door, not just their feet. But you refer to the whole by means of a part. What's that figure of speech called? Synecdoche. Why is that important? Here's a non-controversial example of that. Where a part of a person's body refers, like when you say he's got 200 head of cattle. He has the whole bodies of the cattle, but you say head of cattle, or would you give me a hand to represent your effort, your help? Because that's often used with salvation, where belief is put for the whole thing. You know, Believe on the Lord and you'll be saved. Well, it's just taking the whole process and taking part of it to represent the whole thing. Right, so this is a good example to show people how synecdoche is used in Scripture. Sometimes repentance is used for the whole process. Sometimes belief. Peter uses baptism. So, uh, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. So, the feet of those who buried your husband at the door, they will carry you out. And immediately she fell down and breathed her last. And so when the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. So, notice the inclusio, right? Great fear here down in verse 11. And then what happened up here? Great fear. See, the effect of it was, I mean, honestly, it's to make people afraid. Let's look at what, what, we're, what we mean. See, think of the Old Testament background for this whole episode. Where do you find God doing this sort of thing in Old Testament history? Strange fire with the priests. Okay. 
This is like a game show, right? Okay. You chimed in. All right, that's the number one answer. Uh, it's like family, family feud. Uh, number one answer. Okay, Nadab and Abihu, Leviticus 10. God struck them dead. Now, he didn't do this every time people worship falsely, but why there? That was the consecration of the whole cult of Israel, the whole worship the whole sacrificial system had just been set up and the priests had just been anointed and all the arrangements had been made and set in place and then they corrupted it. And so here again you see at the inauguration of an era, God sends a message and he did that with Nadab and Abihu. Later, uh, remember Korah, Datham and Abiram there in number 16, they, were, they questioned, Mo what's going on here by the way? Apostolic authority is being challenged. Uh, they, they think they can lie to these apostles and God not know it. See, what happened when, num when God opened the ground and swallowed up Korah, Dathan, and Byram and all their families? They were challenging Moses' authority. So it's, another, it's a similar situation. And with Uzzah, there was presumption. Uh, remember, Uzzah uh, touched the ark, but David wasn't transporting the ark uh, as God had ordained. And... Um, even though his motive may have been good, he was struck dead to show the whole, to, uh, to emphasize the holiness of God. So, in these cases, what you're seeing is they were trying, they were really undermining the authority uh, and holiness. Whoops, part of my text came off. Uh, uh, no, undermining. Yeah, no, I've got it. God's, God's authority and His holiness. See, that's why he says, "You haven't lied to men, but you've lied to God." And you see, the effect was to cause everybody else to be in fear. So let's look at a few verses along this. Deuteronomy 13. Uh, look at a similar situation about disciplining in ancient Israel. If your brother, the son of your mother, notice how it's emphasized. It doesn't matter if it's your own full-blooded brother. The son of your mother or the son of your daughter or the, or the wife you embrace. It's like God telling Abraham, take now your son, your only son, whom you love. Kill him. See, it's a, notice how emphatic it is. You're the wife you embrace or your friend who's like your own soul. But he entices you secretly saying... Let's go serve other gods which neither you nor your fathers have known. Some of the gods of the peoples are around you. Uh, whether near you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other, you shall, right, if, if, even if it's someone close to you, you shall not yield to him or listen to him. But see, now here's the thing. Your eyes shall not pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him. You say, well, it's my wife. It's my daughter. It's my best friend. There's a time when a certain kind of pity is sinful where your pity for a person takes precedence over your commitment to the well-being of others. And there's more at stake uh, than just my relationship with that person, but the people of God and the well-being of the people of God is at stake. But you shall kill him, and in fact, fact, notice, not only shall you kill him, but your hand shall be the first one. You shall kill him, and then he says, and your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, uh, and afterward the hand of all the people. And you shall stone him to death with stones, because he sought... Th this is why this is so serious, and, and that's, why, that's why I think God struck Ananias and Sapphira dead right here at the beginning of the, of, of the, of the church, in, in this, this um, early period of the church in Jerusalem. Notice he says, um, because he sought to draw you away from the Lord. See, if sin is allowed, if, if self-promotion and deception and sin and, un, and, and lack of respect for God's inspired spokesman and God's word and God's authority, if that's allowed to infiltrate the body of Christ, people are going to lose their souls. See, that's why th there's so much at stake. He's trying to draw you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. But here's the point. You know how, remember how Luke said everybody else was in fear? He said, And all Israel shall hear and fear. So they'll hear in fear and they'll never do... That, that's the point, is to, to, to save other people as well. So now you say, well, okay, well, that's, that's just the Old Testament, right? Here's another example, though, from Deuteronomy 19, where he's talking about you, you, you have to have two witnesses or three. But what if you have a false witness, a single one who, who's a false witness? He says, well, then, you know, the judges will inquire 
And if it turns out he's, he's accused his brother falsely, verse 19, then you shall do to him as he meant to do to his brother, and so shall you purge. This is important. You can't just allow evil to fester in your midst. Blatant disrespect for the will of God. You cannot allow that. Uh, you, you must purge the evil from your midst. But then here again is the, the emphasis. The rest shall hear in fear. So the idea is for other people to hear in fear. Uh, and never again commit such evil. Your eyes shall not pity. Your eyes shall not pity. So in other words, you can't say, in, in our day, love and compassion has been so grotesquely distorted to mean you must approve of what people believe and do. Uh, you cannot question them. You don't judge. You don't condemn. That's hateful. Uh, and, and that's a lack of compassion. That's intolerant. And, and that's how the, uh, that, that whole mentality has affected, I think, even those who identify as Christian to the point where exercising church discipline, passing judgment on, on impenitent, okay, people who are flagrantly, openly sinning. We all struggle with sin. But when there's flagrant, open sin and it's not repented of, uh, if you exercise discipline, that's considered ungodly, unchristlike, unloving. And that's because people don't read their Bibles, or if they do, they don't care what their Bibles say. So 1 Timothy 5, let the elders... Okay, well, what, wait, that's Old Testament, when God was mean and ugly. But, you know, that, that, was, that was the God who was the God of the Hebrews who was, who was monstrous. You know, when we come to the New Testament, surely we're not going to find that. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, Exhibit A, right? Right? Exhibit A for people who think God was vindictive and cruel and harsh in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, it's all about just fulfilling your dreams, and God wants you to have your best life now, and it's all about just accepting everybody, and we don't pass judgment on everybody, and God's cool with whatever I do, and that's what the church is all about, to make me feel good no matter how I'm living. That's from hell. That's from the devil. But in 1 Timothy 5, this headache's got me angry. Uh, so, no, 1 Timothy 5, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. And then he cites... Scripture, but then he says in verse 19, Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. It's a very serious thing. When we make accusations against one another, they need to be verifiable. But he says in verse 20, Now as for those who persist in sin, look at this. Now imagine if your preacher did this. Rebuke them in the presence of everybody. Now not at some closed door meeting with just the elders. There could be a time when in front of the whole church you have to get up and rebuke a brother. Now, you tell me a church that you know of or ever been in that has ever practiced this. Well, maybe not in a, in a uh, as bold of a way as I'm suggesging. I would like to... Well, or just to get up and rebuke a brother in front of the congregation. Well, we could have done this congregation. All right, well, good. Uh, all right. It's been a long time, though. Well, that's a hard thing to do. It's not pleasant. And we should take no pleasure. We can take a righteous pleasure in it, but we, we should certainly, it's heartbreaking when we have to do it. But notice he says, but why? Well, what's the reason? So, 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 the, so the rest may be in fear. God wants us to be afraid of his judgment. He wants us to be afraid of being put out of the fellowship of the church, of being rebuked in front of the church, to be afraid of being shamed to, uh, of my brothers being ashamed of me and needing to correct me. So this is why uh, I, I think that's so foreign to so many people's thinking is why it's important to address it. But what... what that's the reason they buried him so quickly was so that the people wouldn't mourn or try to mourn? I, I think they're not giving him a lavish memorial service because it was a disgraceful death. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's part of it. Aaron was specifically told not to mourn when his two sons were struck dead. So, so yeah, Aaron wasn't allowed to mourn, but the people were. But uh, they didn't want Aaron to appear that he didn't approve of God's judgment. But, but it, out of practical necessity, but also because of the shame and reproach, I think that's true. But what, notice what we learn about Satan here. And this is what I want to emphasize when I preach on it, is that uh, he says, Satan has filled your heart to lie. Satan filled your heart to lie. The devil in Jewish categories... The devil is, uh, what are the chief functions as far as how Satan is depicted in Scripture? He's our accuser, Revelation 12, 10, the, accusers, the accuser of our brethren. And you see that in Job. Job 
the devil's in, in the presence of God and in the heavenly court accusing Job. And he's a source of temptation. He's called the tempter in Matthew 5, 3. But I think he does his work chiefly as deceiver. He uses lies and propaganda. Let's finish with John 8, 44. You know, just where Jesus was in this heated debate with the Jewish leaders, and he says, you are of your father. Imagine saying this to someone, to, to, to religious leaders. You are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father, it is your will to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and stands not in the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a liar and the father thereof. The devil is the father of all lies. He uses lies and propaganda. Think of what's going on in our own culture. It's a battle for the way people think. And so uh, the, the lies that we face, it, it's, uh, it, it's, an, it's a tool of the devil to corrupt our, our thinking. And they, they lied. Now, the chief problem here wasn't so much the lying and the, and, and the greed and the selfishness, but the challenge to the apostles, I think, is why it was so grave. But that's, of course, the opposite of God who cannot lie. Titus 1, 2, Hebrews 6, 18. Uh, Every word of God is true, Proverbs 30, verse 5. So um, notice what we're told about the devil, and notice what we're told here about the Holy Spirit, too. That's what we'll look at next time. Uh, he said, you lied to the Holy Spirit. So you haven't lied to men, you've lied to God. So we're getting a lot of theology in the passage as well. But um, So we'll, we'll think about this further as we see now problems the church faces from opposition without, problems from corruption within. What do you think is a greater threat to the body of Christ right now in America or to our congregation? Opposition from without or complacency toward corruption from within? I'll let you think about that. That would be a good discussion we could have uh, if I ever let anybody discuss anything in class. But God bless you. Thank you.